Australia. I get to choose the big stories that really interest me. We hear what you have to say, and you hear what I have to say. I really hope you can join me. Eight on Fridays, noon on Saturdays and Sundays. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you ask. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories, the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes, big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wilson. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wilson tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello there, it's six o'clock. I'm Michelle Jubry, and this is Jubes and Co, the show where we'll get into some of the things that have got you talking today. Now, did you know today is World Cancer Day? Well, if you didn't, you know now. And I can't help but wonder, how has the National Health Service, basically becoming the National COVID Service for about two years now, impacted on our cancer care? And we repeatedly discuss the cost of living crisis and many now are blaming the government for creating it. But is it really their fault? And let me ask you this, do you reckon there's such a thing as being too old for the workplace? I ponder this because a 69 year old plumber has been awarded 25 grand in an age discrimination case, in part because his bosses called him half dead Dave because of his age. And Prince Harry has some words of wisdom for us, delivered straight from his $14 million mansion. Apparently, we all need to take some more me time. Gotta be honest, as a working mum, me time is something I've forgotten what it even is. What about you? Do you get any? And one police force has cyclists got them in their line of vision. They've been laying in wait for them to find them for skipping red lights. I tell you what, they caught 18 of them in just 90 minutes. But what do you think? Is that a good use of police time? We'll have all that to come and more, but first, the latest news headlines. Good afternoon, I'm Polly Middlehurst in the GB Newsroom and our top story today, the Conservative MP Aaron Bell has become the latest to submit a letter of no confidence in the Prime Minister. He said he struggled to reconcile assurances Boris Johnson had given him about the Sue Gray report and that the gatherings held in Number 10 made the Prime Minister's position, in his view, untenable. It's reported up to 17 MPs now have submitted letters, but 54 are needed to trigger a vote of no confidence. And Downing Street says the departure of the Prime Minister's Chief of Staff, Principal Private Secretary and Director of Communications yesterday had been agreed beforehand. 
Boris Johnson has reportedly told Downing Street staff that change is good. It comes after reports a fifth adviser, Elena Narazansky, resigned just hours after the other three aides quit. Policy chief Munira Mirza also resigned yesterday. She cited Mr Johnson's refusal to withdraw his claim that Sir Keir Starmer had failed to properly prosecute Jimmy Savile when he was director of public prosecutions. Speaking to the media in London, the health secretary, Sajid Javid, distanced himself from the attack on the Labour leader. I think you know, Keir Starmer, when he was running the, the, the DPP, you know, did, did a good job and he should be respected for it. It's a tough job and he should he deserves absolute respect. Uh, for that, but the Prime Minister has also uh, come out and he's clarified those remarks, and that's important. Sajid David. Seven men have been jailed after a plot to sell on an array of lethal weapons was disrupted by the National Crime Agency. Our home and security editor, Mark White, has this report. This is the moment the law finally caught up with Umar Zahir, a Manchester drugs dealer who bought deadly firearms to enforce his criminal trade. Also arrested by the National Crime Agency, another member of the gang, Bilal Khan. Protesting his innocence, but this is Bilal Khan just days earlier, his head deliberately obscured, posing with an AK-47 he'd just bought. Sayir clutched the same weapon, showing off in another picture. As well as AK-47 assault rifles, Scorpion and Doozy machine guns, handguns and ammunition were all up for sale on an encrypted online site used by criminals across the globe. Robert Brazendale, who helped supply the weapons, was arrested after he fled to Malaga in Spain. In total, seven organised criminals, including drug dealers and gun runners, have now been sentenced to a combined 81 years in jail. Mark White. An order to stop checks on agricultural products and food at Northern Ireland's ports has been suspended by a high court in Belfast. The order was put in place by the Agriculture Minister Edwin Poots yesterday but it's believed the move may have breached international law. The interim suspension will be in place, though, until there's a judicial review into the DUP minister's decision. The move has meant Stormont's executive can no longer meet and it's unable to take significant policy decisions, with the DUP First Minister Paul Givan stepping down last night over the disruption to the Northern Ireland Protocol. And China and Russia have announced a new deep strategic alliance as China's President Xi Jinping hosts Russia's President Vladimir Putin on the opening day of the Beijing Winter Olympics. In a joint statement, the two countries declared their new relationship was superior to any political or military alliance of the Cold War era. The Russian leader's visit to China comes amid growing Chinese support for Moscow in its dispute with Ukraine, one that threatens to break out into conflict. And just lastly, new pictures show the Queen's beloved dog, Candy, rudely interrupting a photo shoot as Her Majesty read cards from well-wishers ahead of her platinum jubilee. The doggy, a cross between a corgi and a dachshund, if you didn't know, joined the Queen at Windsor Castle amid a display of memorabilia from the golden and platinum jubilees. Candy made a lap of the room, <laughs> zoomies, and greeted members of the press. On TV, online and on your radio via DOB Plus here with GB News. Now more from Michelle and Deebs & Co. Thanks for that, Polly. Well, keeping me company until 7 o'clock, my panel. We've got Ali Mirage, who's a columnist at The Article and founder of the Contrarian Prize. Joining me as well, your first time, welcome. We've got The Economist, uh, Jeevan Sander, and we've got Ben Habib, who's the former Brexit Party MEP and the CEO of First Property Group. Now, you know the drill on Jubes and Co by now. I'm sure it's not just about us and our thoughts. i like to hear from you at home. What is on your mind tonight? Uh, tell me all your thoughts on the topics that we're discussing, and is there anything that we should be discussing that we're not? You can email me, gbviews at gbnews.uk. Or you can tweet me, at Michelle Jubes or at gbnews. I'll be coming to some of your thoughts as we go along. But first, today is World Cancer Day. 
And it's a very sad fact that the disease is one of the world's biggest killers. The latest statistics show that more than 160,000 people in the UK die every year from cancer. But it has to be said that the last two years, cancer treatment seems to have taken a bit of a backseat as governments and health authorities are focused on the fight against COVID. A side effect of that, of course, is that cancer diagnoses have fallen sharply in thousands of people that will have started treatment late. Um, sadly, will inevitably lead to many deaths that could have been prevented. So, at the end of a week where a senior World Health Organization official said that the UK was entering, I quote, a plausible endgame in the fight against the coronavirus, should now the NHS be prioritising cancer over COVID? Well, to get into that with me, I'm joined by Professor Carol Sikora, who is a world-leading oncologist and the former head of the World Health Organization's Cancer Programme. Good evening to you and thanks for joining me, Carol. Um, firstly, can you paint a picture for me um, of what, what the cancer statistics look like in the UK at the moment? So every day, a thousand people get cancer. They're diagnosed as having cancer. What's happened over the last two years is less and less because of delays in getting the diagnosis. Cancer Research UK estimate at least 50,000 people still haven't been diagnosed. They have cancer. The problem with cancer is that it spreads. And once it spreads out of the primary organ, lung, breast, colon, prostate, if it spreads outside, the outlook is much poorer. So 90% of people with early cancer confined to the organ that arises are cured, but only 20% of those where there's spread. And that's the key problem. COVID's going, there's no doubt. We've just got to accept not to worry about it. We've got to stop everything and just get on with the normal business of any healthcare system. And we're rather poor at getting back to normality here. Yeah, and I mean, one of the things that I'm calling for, I guess, is that we do start the NHS getting back to being the National Health Service and not necessarily the, the leaning towards the National COVID Service that it has been pretty much exclusively in some cases for almost two years. Um, but what would that actually look like for uh, cancer treatment? What are the tangible things that the NHS should be doing and doing better or faster or quicker, whatever you want to say? What we've got to do is accept that COVID's no longer a big deal. Um, you know, if you look at today's figures for the last 24 hours, less than 1,400 people were actually admitted with COVID-related things. And of course, a lot of them would be in hospital anyway. They've had heart attacks, they've been run over by a bus, and so they get called COVID, but they're not there because of COVID. So the problem for cancer is we've just got to get back to normal, exactly the same for heart disease. And then there are other non-killing diseases. I'm thinking of hip replacements for severe arthritis, disabling to a lot of people. They haven't been able to get an operation. There are something like 7 million people listed awaiting some procedure in the NHS. That means there are almost certainly more. There's probably more than 10 million. And you know, it causes suffering. And so we've got to switch from, as you call it, a COVID service into a, a proper health service again. Yeah, and I was looking, doing a little bit of research prior to talking to you, um, and according to the Cancer Research UK website, it was saying here that around four in 10 UK cancer cases every year could be prevented. I found that quite fascinating. How so? Uh, you know, there are three main causes that are preventable in cancer. One is your diet. So a healthier diet, less fat, less uh, meat, more vegetables, and uh, things that protect you from cancer, nuts, fruit, all these sort of things. Second thing is tobacco. We've known that for years. Just avoid it like the plague. Uh, and then the third thing is infection, papillomavirus, uh, hepatitis, and so on. So these are the three preventable things you can actually do something about. And exercise is another great thing. A lot of exercise, avoiding obesity, uh, you know, all these things protect and reduce your risk of getting cancer. You can't avoid your family background. So there are genetic causes of cancer. Nothing you can do. You haven't chosen your mum and dad. They've chosen you, I guess. Uh, but you can do a lot about your diet, about your exercise, uh, and about tobacco and, and infection. So lots of 
avenues to protect yourself. We've got, we've got to, the same for heart disease, and luckily they're the same. We've got to sort of get over COVID as a population, as patients, not be frightened of it, and just get back to normality. Yeah, I mean, listening to you is one of my viewers, um, Carol, and, and David, he's called, he's just emailed in saying, COVID is more deadly than cancer. What would you say to that? I would say no. I mean, the average age of death of a COVID patient over the last year is 82.5 years. Now, 82.5 is beyond the normal life expectancy of, of, of people in Britain. So if you look at the life years lost over the last year to disease, the COVID life years lost is relatively small. The cancer life years lost is disastrous because the average age is much younger than 82.4. So you'll lose, and the same with heart attacks, so you're losing a lot more patients by prioritizing COVID over the other illnesses. What we're not counting here are the other things we've had, mental health issues, um, even in children, severe mental health issues, which are completely unprecedented. And then, of course, the fact that uh, there are back to the hips and the knees and the arthritis and the waiting lists. People are suffering because of it. So, you know, severe arthritis in the hip is profoundly uh, depressing and it, it immobilizes people. So, getting back to normal is the only thing we can do. Indeed, here, here to that. Uh, that's Professor Carol Sikora there, who's a leading oncologist and the former head of the WHS Cancer Program. Thank you very much for your insight. Um, whilst also Carol was talking, I got another email from another viewer called Russ. Uh, he says, I was diagnosed over the telephone with cancer in April 2020. I've had to fight to have a face-to-face -face appointment and eventually got to see them after nearly a year of pushing. Uh, he says he's in Wales. I mean, I cannot, you're told that you've got cancer over the telephone. I mean, goodness me, Ali, your thoughts? Well, look, I, I think the framing, uh, Michelle, of this as a, as, a, as, as a choice between COVID and cancer is, is just wrong to start with. I mean, we have been through a horrendous time over the last two years and we haven't done it for fun. It was serious that the NHS could potentially have been overwhelmed and a lot of people have died, 150,000 people have died in this country. Uh, so it was a serious issue, but now it is time, and I, this is where I agree with the professor there, it is now time to move from this pandemic state to endemic. And we do have a six million waiting list mm. of which a lot of people do have cancer that's not been diagnosed early. And one of the key things that he said is you've got to catch this stuff early to take the interventions and the treatments. Now, what Sajid Javid's come out and said today is that he wants to try and use some of the technologies that were discovered as part of the vaccine program to try and develop vaccines to tackle cancer. He also wants to use AI and machine learning to try and uh, to try and identify and deal with some of these issues very early. And also, as part, part of the other thing that, that was just said, try and catch these things earlier. So preventative measures on smoking and other issues that can affect other cancers. So I think it is time to try and get things back on an even keel. A few months ago, Sajid Javid said the waiting list could go up to 12 million, which okay. would absolutely be horrendous. Mm -hmm. So we do need to, uh, to coin a phrase, take back control of the health service. But I think it was quite right that they did prioritise covid uh, for the last couple of years, particularly before the vaccine rollout occurred. Do you? See, Ben Habib, your thoughts? Well, I think it's very interesting. I mean, the notion that the NHS had to be saved and we all had to lock ourselves up is a fundamentally flawed notion. The NHS was never going to fail. What, it, what, what would have happened was that the NHS wouldn't have been able to treat the people that needed treatment. But it's an entirely different result. It's an entirely different theme to the theme that the NHS needed saving. And what's actually happened, and Ali's touched on some of the statistics, is in its pursuit of treating COVID at the expense of all other things, the waiting list has gone from 4 million to 6 million. 4 million was bad enough. Mm -hmm. It's now at 6. Forecast to go to 8 and some are now saying 12. So with its predilection for COVID, the government has actually imperiled the NHS. It's in a much more difficult position now than it was before the pandemic. And what they practiced effectively was political triage. They decided that it was COVID patients who were going to get priority over all other patients. And I thought Carol's analysis was superb. 
And his, his conclusion really is we've got to get back to normal. It's not a matter of focusing on COVID over cancer or cancer over cardiovascular disease. Anyone who's read, uh, who knows anything about the functioning of any organization knows that if you're going to make an ecosystem like an organization work properly, you have to have a holistic, balanced approach to the problem. You've got to tackle everything simultaneously to the best of your ability. Ben, it's a lot easier to do that when you've got vaccines that work, which we now do. It is, but the, but the mistake, if a mistake was made, uh, I think, early on, was this notion that um, COVID is the killer that's going to trump all other ailments. As Carol said, the average age of death is beyond the average life expectancy. You know, a lot of, a, a, a very cogent argument can be made um, to suggest that actually those people who died were gonna die anyway pretty soon and COVID tipped them over. And if you look back at total deaths, 2018, 2019, so pre-pandemic, 2020, 2021, and coming into 2022, actually total deaths per annum have hardly budged. COVID hasn't really dented total annual deaths, uh, you know, in the UK. Uh, ben, if I may, you may, first and foremost, my doctor friends and nurse friends who worked in a &E would certainly not agree with you that the NHS was not close to collapse. They described last winter as being like hell. You said that most of the people are going to die no, it's, anyway. It's, it's, it's Actually, a, you don't need to finish it. Yeah. You said that most of them are going to die anyway. I didn't say that. There are people who it's are sitting at home to be made. There's a cogent have, argument to be made. Well, your just, argument is wrong. Yeah. There are 30 and 40 year olds who died during COVID. There are people without their parents. There are people without their children. It's invidious to suggest that, but it's wrong to suggest, Joe. You talk about death rates, and you are right to some extent, of course. People are less likely to die from COVID than cancer. But that is not the nature of the beast. The nature of the beast was an infectious disease. And what's the problem with an infectious disease? when it spreads and it stops people from working as doctors, as nurses, and incapacitates them, it poses a huge problem to the entire system of the NHS and the country. That's why we had to treat COVID. That was not an easy decision to make, but it was the right decision to make. But and when, look, no one enjoyed being locked down, but we did it for a good reason and the right reason. But when you say COVID stopped people working, often what's actually stopped people from working is the testing regime, the self-isolation regime. So it's not the ailment, the illness and the symptoms, it's the response and the reaction to it that we've put in. That is what's uh, damaged workforces, not just in the NHS, by the way, but way beyond. I don't think we can blind ourselves and try and choose not to test. COVID would still be there. And the problem is, of course, is that actually, if we didn't test as much, the virus would spread more widely and our hospitals would be overwhelmed a lot more quickly. But why, that is why, true why? that we had to stay at home, but the problem was when A&E waiting times were so long and you couldn't get into hospital, that's why we had to... But hospitals away. never get overwhelmed. Time. They simply cease treating people. You do appreciate the difference. Uh, yes. Hospitals will always, op will, they'll always perform, they'll always perform their function. They just won't be able to treat as many people. And effectively, the prioritisation uh, uh, for COVID over other ailments was saying, it was political triage. Don't treat cancer patients. Don't treat cardiovascular patients. Treat COVID patients. That's, that's not preventing the hospitals from being overwhelmed. It's choosing one form of ailment over another. I don't think there's any functional difference between an ambulance queue that goes 20 ambulances back and you can't treat them and a system that isn't functioning. No, that system is not the functioning optics are, as intended. The optics may be different, but as Carol said, People were getting cancer, not being diagnosed, and effectively more likely to die of it as a result because they were locked up at home. You can't see them. You don't feel the pain. It's not as optically, politically damaging as ambulances lined up with COVID patients. But the same effect is happening. It's just the NHS is treat, choosing not to treat cancer patients and is choosing to treat COVID patients. It's not at all the same effect. If you have a system where people cannot turn up to the doctors or the hospitals because there are too many COVID patients, because again, you have an infectious disease, then that's the same functional problem. And also you speak about cancer, you think about heart attacks as well. You think about someone who's broken their leg or in a serious accident. If they can't get into A&E, that's a system that isn't working. And it was not a choice we wanted to be confronted with, but it's one we ended up with. And it wasn't a political triage, it was a decision made in order to stop it being overwhelmed, not just by in this country, but of course across the world. Ali? Look, I, I look, look there, there is a group of respected scientists who signed the Great Barrington Declaration that made the argument uh, that, that I think Ben is advocating here, that a life should have continued as normal, the vulnerable should have been protected, and everyone else should have got on as normal, and effectively the disease should have spread 
and become endemic over time. That's the argument that Sunitra Gupta and various other people make. And I, I respect the, these people, but I disagree with their view. And it's just a different view that I, that I hold. I mean, look, a number of people nearly, I think Jeevan's made the point quite rightly, it wasn't just old people. It was a very new disease. We didn't know much about it. The world was grappling with how to tackle it. There were multiple lockdowns going on across the world. In fact, our lockdown, some would argue, occurred a little bit lacklustre. We were a bit late to the party, actually, when you remember the prime minister standing at the podium telling us that we would lose a lot of our loved ones before their time. I mean, I was shocked at that, actually, to be honest. I mean, I, I locked up my parent at home and said, you're not going out. I, I, I hold you hostage at home. You will not go out <laughs> because you have to take your own decisions, right, to protect yeah. your loved ones. Um, and you were right to do that. Absolutely right. That was, that was your choice to make, and you made the right choice. You protected your elderly but parents. Then, but then, Ben, you, there right. were a lot of unscrupulous employers, right, that were making their staff go to work in that period when, 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 the, when the, the virus was rife. We didn't know much about it. We didn't have vaccination in place. Now I understand that we've got vaccines in place. They work well. Yes, there was a variant. We got boosters, and it's a different scenario, and let's hope it remains that way, and it can tackle new variants. But at the time... It was new. It was worrying. People, people were scared. It was. And it was a big, big but, issue around the world. But would you agree that we knew quite early on that this is a disease that really hits the elderly much more than other people? That is something we knew very early on. But it wasn't a flu, and which the, is what a lot of people say. And the Great Barrington Declaration, I'm really glad you mentioned it. Thank you for mentioning it. You know, is supported. It was, it, it was, uh, it was conceived by and supported by eminent epidemiologists and medic, medics across the globe. And it was rubbish by our government. You know, yeah, Hancock absolutely rubbished it in the Commons. He never gave it any any airtime at all. That, I disagree that you, you should be able to have a civilised debate, even within the scientific community. So I support the right of the Great Barrington Declaration academics to come up with their views. They have a view. They're epidemiologists. They're, they're entitled to it. I just think that the, the bulk of scientific opinion was against it. But they're right. They should be respected for that view. But do you consider that there disagree. wasn't, though, that, that Great Barrington Declaration? Yeah. Well, in fact, it wasn't just Great Barrington Declaration, by the way. It's, it was anyone that seemed to disagree in any way, shape or form with the official recognised narrative was silenced, was censored. That's wrong. You know, you know, look, Michelle, you know me. I founded the Contrarian Prize. I'm all for mm. contrarian <laughs> views, right? Uh, I, I think we need to... It's a much bigger issue than just the virus, quite frankly. It's an issue about civil uh, debate in this country that you should be able to listen to people with an opposing view and argue it out and let the best ideas win out. Quite well, right. Well, you can do that on GB uh, News. You can do it on Jubes and Kerr. Lots of people appreciating the debates. And I have to say, uh, whilst these guys are uh, debating, I'm also listening and watching the inbox Lots of you getting in touch with some of your stories. I'm going to be reading them properly in the break uh, and sharing some of your comments. Uh, lots of you, unfortunately, telling me that you have been diagnosed with cancer throughout this pandemic. I'm very sorry to hear that. And I'll be reading out some of your comments when I come back in just a few minutes. When I do come back, I'll be talking about the cost of living crisis. Now, uh, we all know what it is, but what's caused it? There's a lot of people laying the blame squarely at the government's door. But is it really that simple? I'll see you in a couple of minutes. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you dare. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs>
News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from 6 to half past 9 on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello there, welcome back to Jubes & Co with me, Michelle Jubery. Uh, I will just remind you briefly of who my panel uh, is tonight because I know lots of you are listening. Um, rather than watching, we've got Ali Mirage, who is a columnist at The Article and the founder of the Contrarian Prize. We've got Jeevan Sander, who is the uh, economist at King's College London, and Ben Habib, former Brexit Party MEP and CEO of the First Property Group. Now, we were just talking a second ago before the break about cancer and COVID. Uh, lots of you guys getting in touch. I'll just read a few of them. Mike says, uh, my wife uh, was told she had terminal pancreatic cancer over the telephone. Um, I mean, awful. She'd finished work as a social care worker and was asked to telephone back, which she did, only to be informed she had um, pancreatic two and a half weeks later. She was no longer with us. Uh, he says she was only 51. Um, I'm really sorry to hear that, Mike. Sorry for your loss. Lots of you, unfortunately, uh, sharing with me similar uh, conversations. Robert says, last year I was unable to see my GP with throat and ear pain after having six uh, telephone appointments. I was uh, prescribed many different medications, he says. Uh, he finally went to see a private consultant who gave him an MRI uh, and was told he had throat cancer. He says he's just finished, um, sorry, he finished radio, radiotherapy seven months ago and is still recovering. Uh, sorry to hear your story and very best wishes to you. Janice says, I am a survivor of cancer um, and she basically thanks um, the NHS for helping her, as, as does Kim. She was also diagnosed with cancer during the pandemic, diagnosed in late May. Um, but she says she's had no delay, she's had a great service. Um, and yeah, thank you very much to the NHS. What can we say? Um, right, let's move on. Lots of you keeping those comments uh, coming in and I will read um, more of them. I can see them, lots of you coming in with very similar stories. I'm very sorry, of course, to hear any diagnosis of cancer. Um, and I do wish all of you well. Um, if I don't read out your email, I do apologize for that. Uh, now, shall we talk about cost of living? We all know what this is by now. It's on pretty much all the front pages all the time. It's pretty much everything, isn't it? Whether it's insurance uh, rates went up, they doubled yesterday. Uh, energy, the price cap, again, that's gone up. Uh, rising inflation, I mean, where do we end? We've got national insurance about to go up. Um, People are trying to make political point scoring. You've got Labour uh, coming out and saying that the government are not doing enough. There's talks of windfall taxes uh, on the energy companies. But a lot of people I'm noticing are really angry, understandably so at the moment, worried, understandably so. But a lot are blaming the government purely and squarely for this. And I wonder, is it that simple, Jeevan? Well, the truth is there are global forces. We've seen inflation rise across the world. Energy prices are rising across the world. Shipping costs are somewhere between five and 10 times higher than before the pandemic. But this government has also made this cost of living crisis worse. They've reduced the amount of money in people's pockets, a thousand pound cut to universal credit. We've got upcoming tax rises as well, national insurance, a little bit of income tax. That's gonna be 600 pounds for the average family. That makes it harder. And on the other side, our costs may be rising across the world, but ours are particularly bad. And why? Well, actually, in part because of a Brexit deal. That means our shipping costs are 25% higher than they are for the continent. Now, those, those lorries you see backing up outside of Dover, that's an extra couple of pence or pound on your food, weekly food shop. It's costing more to get goods into this country because we have a Brexit deal that is not working. And if this government wants to solve this problem, really, put more money in people's pockets, and on the other hand, get a Brexit deal that works and try and keep costs down.
Ben Habib, you was indeed a Brexit uh, party MEP. So what would you say to some of that? Well, I'll come to Brexit in a second. But, you know, we've, we've had a cost of living problem in the UK for years and years and years. And we've had a Conservative government for the last 12 years. So absolutely, the government is responsible for the cost of living difficulties that we have. Clearly. What, all of them? Well, we've had 12 years. You know, we have... The government's you... responsible for the wholesale energy price rises? No, no, no. We've had a, we've had a crisis recently, but the, we've had a problem with the cost of living that predates the pandemic. You know, the United Kingdom is a highly regulated, highly taxed, highly costly economy. And it's this government that's been in charge since 2010, so they have to take responsibility for it. Part of the problem, we haven't, we've talked about it on previous programmes, but part of the problem is the printing of money, quantitative easing, because the result of that has been to surreptitiously steal money out of the back pockets of the working class who only have cash, they, you know, they, 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 they get their salary checks and they, they spend them. So cash is the only commodity they hold. And quantitative easing, the, the, the printing of money, effectively devalued the pound in their pocket, boosted the value of housing, boosted the value of hard assets, stock market investments and so on, and therefore boosted the wealth of the rich. So the, 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 uh, the, the, the response to cure the credit crunch actually hit the working classes harder, increase their cost of living. And the response to the pandemic has been, again, the printing of money at a rate that we didn't even see anything like in the last credit crunch. So we've printed something like 500 billion pounds in the last couple of years. Again, that damages uh, the working in uh, working classes and the poor are much harder than it damages anyone else. So we've had, uh, if you like, an expansion of money which makes asset prices and getting on the housing ladder much more expensive. But we've also had a very highly regulated economy. Every regulation adds cost. Every cost is a burden on the working and, uh, uh, and middle classes. And on top of that, we've got a highly taxed economy. I don't think it's to do with Brexit. I think Brexit has, by it, to a very significant extent, been squandered by this government because actually it was a phenomenal opportunity to cut regulations, to cut taxes, to jettison all that EU red tape, which would have freed up British business, freed up the city, and we would have had a much wealthier uh, re uh, result from Brexit if the Prime Minister hadn't signed us up. I do agree with you, it's a lousy trade deal he signed up. But I, I think it's a lousy trade deal probably for reasons that... that uh, 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 diametrically opposed to the reasons you have. I mean, I would have left the European Union on WTO terms, and I would have slashed regulations and taxes, and I would have uh, put money in the back pocket of the working and working classes and the middle classes in this country. Ali, just hold that yeah. thought one second. I'm just keen to yeah, look, Ali. Look, look I, I, I don't agree with Ben in, in terms of the, the whole Brexit thing, but, but uh, in terms of the WTO terms, etc., I think they got the best deal they could have got at the time. Uh, the problem is that there are issues. There are issues not only economic ones, political ones, on the on the uh, the, the border in the Irish Sea issue, which is causing a, a political crisis in Northern Ireland as well. But if you come back to the economics of this, you've got a very very difficult situation. I was listening to um, Larry Summers, the former Treasury Secretary, in conversation with Peter Mandelson yesterday, talking about the fact that even in the U.S., the Fed did too much monetary easing. Uh, during the uh, during the uh, coronavirus crisis, and they they overdid it. So now what we're seeing is a real big bounce back, which is not just happening in the U.S. but globally here as well. Um, Ajivan talked about you know the fact that you know that th there there are supply chain issues. This is all being caused on the back of a huge rise in demand, on the back of the global economy emerging from a slumber for the last two years. Right. So that's part of the issue. I think it's quite right to say that there were co cost of living issues before and. In this pandemic, you alluded to it, Michelle, the disparity between the very rich and the poorest has grown. The problem with all this is, and I think the government's trying to do its bit, Rishi Sunak came out yesterday with this £9 billion, uh, announcement where he's going to be giving us £200 loans uh, this year and then £150 off most people's council tax bills. It's a step in the right direction. I think the key issue for the Tory party is whether they go down Ben's road of this Singapore on Thames open regulation, low tax, pro-growth uh, model, or whether they actually go for something a bit more nuanced, which is, seems to be Sunak's argument. And he's saving himself. Obviously, he wants to be prime minister at some point. He wants to endear himself to the Tory right at some stage, which is to give a tax giveaway towards the uh, next election. It's not going to happen now. But we have to get real. We have spent uh, 400 billion in borrowing to, to prop up 
uh, us over the last two years with furlough schemes and other things has to be paid for. The problem is it's not just the lowest in society, lowest paid in society that's suffering. It's also the middle that is being Yeah, and the middle class. Well, I right? completely agree. The middle class is all the way through. Absolutely. But we do have to cut regulations. We do have to get away from this massive, inexorable march towards a, a super state. You know, Rishi Sunak putting money back into the system to head off the, uh, head off the removal of, uh, of caps on fuel prices is just taxpayers' money coming back to them in another form. I mean, what we've got is a tax and spend government. We have the highest taxes over the last 70 years. We have some of the biggest state spending ever. And this is a Tory government. So, so your argument, Ben, would be to grow your way out of trouble. I mean, Absolutely. we have got a 400 billion the only of borrowing way. debt, and we've got two trillion of public debt anyway. You cannot, you cannot emerge from economic difficulty by cutting back. You can only emerge through growth. Even Margaret Thatcher never really cut budgets in real terms. We grew our way through the 1980s. She did expand the state early on in her premiership, remember? But, but, and she got a lot of criticism for that. But she, she, she broke... Well, we would, I don't want to have a discussion about Maggie yeah, Thatcher, but she yeah. did significant supply-side reform, which was a critical component for getting the United Kingdom going. And this government is heading in the opposite direction, highly regulated. And the, and the one thing I want to touch on is net zero. You know, net zero is going to have a cost at the Treasury's own admission of £1.4 trillion. Just pause and think about that figure, £1.4 trillion. That is 70% of our national debt. It's, the cost, it's a cost of £50 billion per annum between now and 2050. And we're signed up to it in the trade and cooperation agreement with the EU. Can you believe it? We can't extricate ourselves from that commitment unless the EU agrees it. So I would have thought you understood the principle of a cost-benefit analysis. It's true we are going to have to spend about 1.4 in gross terms, but in net terms, actually about 400 billion until we get that 2050 stage. And by the way, in terms of a cost and a benefit, if there's a planet that burns where we can't afford to live that well, that's a, that's a great narrative. Wars, that's, that's a great narrative. Yeah. Actually, the cost not just to this generation, but every generation forward is so much greater. Yes, the cost to get to net zero is absolutely correct, not just for future generations. And of course, that is the most important point, but also that we have cleaner air. And you talk about this cost of living crisis, a good point to make. Why is it, for example, in this country, our energy bills are rising so high? Well, in part because we're so dependent upon natural gas. And why are we so dependent upon natural gas? Because we didn't diversify our grid in the 2010s and we didn't insulate homes to ensure that people would have lower energy bills today. That's part of the reason why. And we, why. Didn't, buy, we didn't build nuclear. No, but, no, no, but Jivin, come on. You've got to also... I, I, I understand where you're coming from. We're a lot less dependent on gas than, for example, Germany is and other parts of Europe are, right, who are still going to be agonising about whether to sign off the Nord Stream 2 pipeline coming in um, via the Baltic into Russia. And all the issues around energy security that you're alluding to are actually vital ones. But I do think some credit for the government where it's due, right? I'm not the biggest fan of the government lately, <laughs> but on this particular point, I think they have made some progress on renewables. The mistake they did make was on energy storage, which was, a, which was, a, which was a, an error that they made by closing down that storage capacity. But look, moving forward, we are going to be leading the world, hopefully, in new technologies, battery storage, carbon capture and storage, hydrogen, all these emerging technologies. We, are, we have but, uh, grown our wind and solar capacity well, particularly offshore wind, a lot more yeah. than other countries. But you, you said hopefully, and I completely agree. If the technology exists, we can make the jump to net zero. What we're doing is saying we're going to make the jump to net zero and hopefully the technology will exist. We are creating a massive burden for the British economy, for the working classes, for the middle classes. Sorry. On that topic, and yeah. I have to say, I've been sitting back and letting you guys go for it, and people <laughs> have been loving the debate that you guys have been having. Um, I was going to talk about Prince Harry, but really sorry, Prince Harry. Um, that was more interesting, quite frankly. Uh, very briefly, a yes or no answer. We talk about net zero, and it sparks a lot of uh, response from people. Uh, ben Habib, do you think we should have a referendum? about net zero, about our commitment, our desire and drive to achieve net zero to the time frames? Well, uh, we could have a referendum. Yes we wouldn't or be no, able... I need to go to a break. Do you um, yes or no? Yeah, I think it's a huge commitment. Yes, we should have a referendum. No. No? I don't know referendums. We have enough of them already. <laughs> so that's, uh, what, two no's and a yes. What do you reckon to net zero? I know lots of you have passionate thoughts about that. Um, green, net zero, clean air. 
should we be all going for net zero? And by the way, what about China? It's not just about us. I think we have something like 1%. I would be focusing more on China. Jeevan would probably be disagreeing with me, but I've got to go to a break. When I come back, I want to talk to you about lots of stuff. I want to talk about cycling. I want to talk about age discrimination and more. So I'll see you then. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you dare. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes, big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Jeevan Stott. Hello there. Um, welcome back to Jubes and Co. I'm Michelle Jubery. A brief reminder of who is keeping me company tonight. We've got Ali Mirage, who's the columnist at The Article and founder of the Contrarian Prize. We've got Jeevan Sander, who's the economist at King's College London, and Ben Habib, who's a former Brexit Party ME, uh, MEP and also a CEO of the First Property Group. We're having some good debate here. I've got to say, these guys can talk, and you guys are absolutely <laughs> loving it at home, I tell you. Um, many of you uh, getting in touch. Uh, Saren said, great debate. You don't get that on any other channel. I think that's Ali's dad. Is that right? And in there, loving the conversation. Uh, Mark says, when talking about cost of living, Michelle, we've never had it so good. Now we've got a bit of a squeeze and everyone is moaning. He says, get on with it. I've got to say, though, Mark, many disagree. Carol says, I'm on pension credit. I get far less than the minimum wage to live on. We have a low pension in the UK compared to other countries. She goes on to say, I now feel like I have to leave this country. It is simply too expensive for me to live in. Um, interesting. Steve says, a referendum, Michelle. That was me asking earlier on about whether or not uh, we should have a referendum on net zero. Steve says, no. How many more do you want? Sure. I'm bored with Save the Planet. We should just go nuclear, he says. Well, there you go. Um, referendum, yes, no. Um, Jeff says, net zero is a fantasy. Mm, well, it's an expensive one, I can tell you that. Uh, anyway, let's move on, shall we? I want to talk about age. After all, we are all getting older, whether we like that or not. But what do you think as we live longer? Should we be working longer? Many people, of course, stay in the workforce after retirement age. However, one plumber on the Isle of Wight was mocked for his age and called half-dead Dave by his colleagues. Um, I shouldn't laugh, sorry. Uh, it's not amusing at all, it's serious. Dave Robinson, Dave Robson, sorry, was 69 years old when he was made redundant. He won £25,000 after an employment tribunal, found that he was unfairly dismissed I think 7,000 of that, by the way, was for the name calling. So I wonder, is there really such a thing as being too old to work? 
Ben Habib. I don't know why I'm coming. No offence, <laughs> but I'll come to you first. Well, I, I'm a great believer in people working for longer, going on working. Uh, certainly, I will go on working until I, uh, you know, I'm absolutely forced out of the workplace. Um, but you know, we are an aging population, and we've got to recognise that. One of the reasons cost of living is going up is because we are an aging population. There's a, lower, a smaller and smaller working population in relation to the a the aging aspect, and so they're having to work harder to support the rest. So I think we should all go on working longer. I think that. Um, enforced retirement at a particular age is actually giving up on fantastic experience that people gain as they get older. And whilst I may be now at the age of 56, slower and only very marginally less energetic than I was, I do think I've got a much, I've got much more experience. So I make up for the, for, for my, you know, my, my slight slowness as a result of, uh, of you know, 30 years of um, work experience. And so a half dead Dave should never have really been called half dead Dave. And he should have been encouraged to go on and have a, you know, have a, a happy continued existence as a plumber for as long as he wanted to and was able to do so. Yeah, I do have to say the, uh, the company said it was just banter, but obviously a tribunal ruled differently. Ali? Well, I think the, 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 the surest way to uh, not be forced into retirement is to set up your own company like Ben has, right? So you're not going to be removed from your own company. And by the way, Ben, I think you've always got more and more energetic every time I've seen you talking about the Brexit debate <laughs> over the course of the last few years. So it's certainly going the right way. Um, look, I think on, a, on this particular case, I, I think calling someone half dead, Dave, is pretty rude. It's just downright rude and insensitive, to be honest. I think... They used to call should... him Disco Dave as well, apparently. Uh, that, that, that's, prob that's, probably, that's probably more fun. But, uh, no, I, look, I think we should treat each other with respect. I mean, there's no need to be rude to someone. Absolutely right. I, I think if there are certain professions where uh, physically or mentally you're, you're finding it difficult, for example, if you're a frontline army officer, for example, uh, you might find it a bit difficult if you're driving a tank at age 69, right? I mean, <laughs> physically, you might not be capable of doing it. I'm not saying that every 69-year-old will be in that position, but certainly some would. Uh, I, I'm not, I'm not, I wouldn't be able to do that now at age 47, right? So um, it, it does vary, and I also think that there are certain parameters. For example, magistrates have to retire at 70, I believe, uh, because it's very demanding and very taxing when you're in the courtroom. You don't want to be making mistakes. So you've got to be alert. So there are some uh, areas where... You know, you do need to have certain faculties, either mental or physical, to do your work. But I do think, to Ben's point, we are going to be living longer. I do think people should be probably going to be having two or three careers in the course of their lifetimes, and we need to be more nimble. And what that does mean, Michelle, is that people need lifelong learning, skills as they grow older, to pivot into new jobs. I mean, we've just been talking about the new tech revolution, AI, artificial intelligence, cyber, all this sort of stuff coming down the track. We do need people to fulfill these roles, and they don't all have to be just young people. Old, older people as well can add a lot to the workforce. Indeed, Jivan. Well, look, I think we'd all agree this was uh, not, not the right thing to say, actually pretty gruesome and grim. And also that everyone who wants to and can work for longer should be working for longer and be respected. And yes, you will, of course, have greater experience within the workplace. One thing we should think about as well is those who are feel they have to work beyond retirement age because they can't make ends meet. Mm. There are two million people, two million pensioners rather, in this country living in poverty. When it comes to next year, both the state pension and pension credit, which is a social security payment for those low income pensioners, will only increase by around 3%, whilst cost of living, of course, will go up by seven. Mm -hmm. So actually for those pensioners, we often talk about, and I as a young person often talk about the great deal that pensioners got, you know, they got to buy those houses that exploded mm -hmm. in value, but that by no mean was every single pensioner. There are pensioners who are struggling to put food on the table. There are pensioners who are struggling to heat their homes. And for those who cannot work, I feel they have to, they shouldn't have to be put inside that position, where they should actually be enjoying, rather, the end of their lives. Indeed, and I have to say, there's lots of you guys getting in contact with me saying that you are um, experiencing uh, struggles now. You're, you've got your pensions and you are struggling. Um, look, do you know what? I've only got about five minutes left, so I'm just going to touch on another couple of topics, if you don't mind. So um, let's talk cycling, shall we? Are you a cyclist? Um, are you a car driver? You know, obviously, we've just had these new changes, haven't we, in the highway code? But I wonder... Um, if you've ever seen the cyclist kind of jump the red light, uh, as I've seen often, if I'm honest, I've probably done it a few times as well. Um, but I wonder, 
Do you think it's a good use of police time to position themselves at said red light specifically to try and catch cyclists jumping them? I ask because the police force in London did just that, position themselves there. This is the Met Police. Um, Operation Vision Zero, basically. Long story short, because I'm tight on time. Uh, 14 high -vis officers in Hackney uh, took to these red lights. They caught 18 cyclists jumping red lights within 90 minutes, gave them a 50 quid fine. What do you think to it, panel? I'll start with you. Well, I mean, first of all, I'm a cyclist and it's you know, great to be a cyclist. I mean, was it a good use of police time? Look, I'm not really sure. But it is certainly true that actually cyclists should stop at red lights. We also need to find a way to ensure that kind of cyclists and cars can share the road safely. I think cities are much better with more bikes. If you go to Amsterdam, it's a wonderful city to walk around. I kind of wish central London was more like that, and particularly kind of Oxford Circle and Oxford Street as well. It'd be a much more pleasant place to be, but certainly, of course, uh, should it be skipping red lights. Um, I cycled from London to Amsterdam once a few years ago. It was wonderful. <laughs> um, ben, your thoughts briefly, gentlemen? Very briefly. 11% of serious crime results in an arrest, and only 2% of serious crime results in con conviction. So the notion that you have dozens of police officers watching cyclists going through red lights is just beyond me. I mean, I think cyclists should stop at red lights. Um, that would be a good thing, but I don't think it's a good use of police time, particularly the Mets, who should be investigating parties at the moment. That's where they should be spending their energy. Ali? I am a cyclist. I do believe that uh, cyclists should stop at red lights, and I, it's a bane, actually. I think it's easier to count the number of cyclists who do stop at a red light rather than the number who don't, because most don't. And then all that happens is you unfortunately see bouquets of flowers by traffic lights where they've been knocked over and killed, which is really unfortunate. So, yes, we should all respect each other and stop at lights and also respect pedestrians as well. What do you think to these new um, highway code rules that put the cyclists often in the middle of the road? I've got to say, I found them very annoying. Have it's you, absurd. Have you, have you experienced it yet? You're in your car and there's a, a cyclist or a collection of them in the middle of the road. They're advised now to go in tandem in the middle of the road and, and, and the new highway code requires that cars give them a one and a half metre berth. Can you imagine doing that on a London road? You'd have head-on collisions. Uh, it, it's absolutely daft as brushes. If you're, on a, if you're a pedestrian, you've got to take real care because you're the most vulnerable. If you're a cyclist, you've got to take real care because you're vulnerable. If you're in a car, you've got to take real care because you are the most powerful, if you like, on the road. But we've got to let people make their own judgments and behave you know, within the norms of, uh, of the law without having to legislate for how many cyclists can go two abreast down the road and what sort of berth we have to give them. Well, there you go. That is pretty much, unfortunately, all we have got time for. Um, so many of your emails and texts, and not texts, you've not been texting me, um, but tweeting me, you know what I mean. Uh, so many of you writing in, and I'm sorry, uh, lots of you talking to me about the cancer situation. Sorry again for lots of you uh, that are experiencing this. To Phil, you just messaged saying that you are starting chemotherapy on Monday, so we wish you all the best um, with that. Lots of people getting in touch saying that they've really enjoyed the conversation tonight. Bryson says, civilised debates on a British news channel. Is this a first, he says. <laughs> Uh, he says, thank you for the turn of the programme. Billy says, uh, please will you ask Michelle to refrain from saying, you know the drill every night during her introduction. It's very chavvy, he says. <laughs> well, unfortunately, Billy, I will not refrain from saying it. I like it. Uh, and as I, I will end, in fact, on that note, because I like it so much. Uh, and you do indeed know the drill. You can carry on uh, emailing me if there's anything that you want us to be discussing on the future uh, episodes of Jubes & Co. Email me, gbviews at gbnews.uk. You can tweet me at Michelle Jubes or at gbnews. I've just been told I've got about six seconds before I need to stop talking, so I'll end it by saying thank you to my panel. We've had Ben, Ali, we've had uh, Jeevan and you at home keeping us company. Thank you. Have yourself a great weekend and you know the drill i'll see you monday hello again it's going to be a windy weekend for all and for summer a wintry weekend particularly in scotland where we will see further snow showers elsewhere we're more likely to see outbreaks of rain this weather front introduced the colder air that you've 
probably noticed through the day today. More weather fronts are approaching. They will spread outbreaks of rain across the country tomorrow. But in between, many places becoming dry overnight. We do still have snow showers coming into western Scotland. However, the snow could build up here over some of the higher routes and potentially cause a little bit of uh, disruption. The snow showers will ease across